it felt like it could have been a tough Monday, but things look all right. Yeah, and in fact, uh, we've been through these types of situations before where there's fear of war, kind of gets priced in. Once something happens, markets tank. This time it happened over the weekend, so the stock markets, the traditional markets couldn't move. The only thing that could move was something that trades 24-7. Do you know anything like that? <laughs> Crypto. Uh, and that took a big, nasty dip. There were some terrible wicks out there, and all the different exchanges had different prices. Did you notice any of that? Like, I noticed it, that. I mean, people panicked, I think. And uh, sadly, I think a lot of people got shaken out there at the bottom. A lot of people got liquidated if they had leverage positions. And yeah, huge differences between exchanges. Pax, Pax Gold uh, went to over 3,000. Uh, so clearly, like people panicked. They panicked, sold. They thought, okay, what should I buy instead? Uh, buy like gold proxy because. Uh, this looks uh, looks dangerous. And I mean, I felt concerned too on Saturday evening, actually, my time zone. So, um, yeah, I, fortunately for me, I didn't take uh, any action. I didn't sell anything or anything like that. Yeah, I did a little bit of, a little bit of buying, but uh, it was interesting as well because the markets already sniffed something out on Friday. Like Bitcoin fell to 65,000 and even lower on down. It did, did dip down on Friday. And then that big wicked dip, like I heard some exchanges like Binance hit 60K, Coinbase hit 62K. Um, and then afterwards, it rebounded very aggressively on different news. But before we jump into the news, let's go through uh, kind of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, some There's some Bad news and good news. We're going to cover it all, and we're going to take some questions at the end as well. Um, but let me make sure I got this. Uh, we're going to talk about, first of all, the channel you need to subscribe to. Link is below, CTO Larson. And the big story is two superpowers are now in. And I've been anticipating this Chinese ETF for a long time. People say it'll be big. People say it'll be small. It'll be a nothing burger. But you have traveled a lot in Asia and you know a lot about exactly how that culture invests. And it's very different to the West. Like the US is considered very conservative depend compared to say China. And we also know how much China have invested in things like real estate over the past 10 years. That was their only life raft. Nah, and they got clobbered with that life raft. In many places, their investment is either completely lost or down 60% plus. It's a disaster. What's your take on Asia? how they invest, and this Bitcoin ETF news. You're muted. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. And I think you need to mute when I speak. I see some yep. people saying that. Okay. okay. So, um, yeah, I lived 12 years in Asia and uh, it is different. It is different. People are much, much more positive to new things, more positive to change, more open to digital solutions and much faster, much faster in general to take action and move forward. So, and I think that a lot of people in Asia are already investing in crypto, no doubt, but a little bit maybe the same like in the US, there will be big institutions, big entities that couldn't really do it. Opening an ETF avenue in Asia is huge. It is gigantic. And I think it will have a huge impact just like it had in the US. So this is very exciting, actually. Uh, very exciting. So fantastic news that we're getting here with the Hong Kong uh, approvals. I see that it's, uh, it has said like conditional approvals, but from what I can understand, it is clear. Yeah, uh, from, from what I see too, they're going to launch tomorrow. Let's look at some of the news here as well. Uh, let's try to blow this up so the audience can see. Uh, is this no? Hang on, guest. Hang on. There, yeah, this is bigger and better. So, the floodgates. We we always spoke about the life raft being Bitcoin, but now this is a very large development in China. They need alpha. They are not risk averse. Not as risk averse as Western investors. You know, I look at the world in kind of three buckets. You have kind of the largest, most sophisticated market is the United States. 
um, but they're also sometimes quite conservative. You have Europe, not as sophisticated, even more conservative, and then you have Asia, and they will sometimes throw money at what they need just to survive. And this is something that Asia needs. And let me tell you why. We know the real estate market is terrible, but we also know the stock market has been horrible, basically zero return since 2014, whereas the S&P 500 has done very well. Uh, and Chinese investors can't invest in the S&P 500. But these are the three firms that are coming in. There's actually four firms, two have partnered up. One is Harvest Global, $100 billion shop. And this is data from August 2023. It's probably a little bit higher now. You've got Hashkey and Bucera, who partnered. They're small, $50 billion. And then China Asset Management, over $300 billion. And there's lots of talk that, oh, uh, this is Hong Kong only. No, it's not. So Hong Kong, I consider the financial district from mainland China, and they are the number one trading partner with each other. And the, you add all these together, you nearly have half a trillion. And yes, it's not as big as BlackRock. But these people, so the BlackRock average BlackRock investor may only invest half of 1% or 1%. And these people have no problem putting in 5% or 10%. What do you think about the risk tolerance for the investors in this part of the world? Much more risk tolerant. It's a gigantic difference. <clears throat> and um, you can see it if you go, if you walk around, say, in um, any, you can pick any country in Asia and you ask, uh, do you own crypto? And most people, many people will say yes, M many more people than in um, Western Europe or in the US. And then which, uh, which crypto then? In the US or say Europe, it will be yeah, I have some Bitcoin, some Ethereum and so on. But there it will be, yeah, I'm a big investor and there will be some project you've never heard about. And um, that is a huge difference. So it just illustrates that the risk tolerance is much higher. And um, they are, I mean, something like Bitcoin is, is definitely in the risk portfolio. It's kind of low risk even. I think for many, so it, it will it will have huge impact. Guaranteed, if this kind of really works out, and it's an avenue for big asset managers to you know put significant money into Bitcoin, absolutely. That's good to know. The other angle, this is what is super interesting as well. Switching gears. We know, like we saw it over the weekend, we saw gold, and, and gold is a kind of risk-off asset. Gold is what people invest in in times of war. We've seen gold break new all-time highs. Uh, hard assets are sought out in these very uncertain times. Now, it, there's so much confusion, and there has been for years. Is Bitcoin an inflation hedge? Is Bitcoin digital gold? that you buy in times of war, etc. It hasn't quite proven to be the case that that is happening. However, <laughs> what is interesting is a lot of people do expect Bitcoin to beat the gold market cap because it has so many more benefits. Would you mind refreshing for the audience how difficult it is to trade gold, move gold, store gold, verify gold, all those different types of things? transfer it, ship it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, last year, we interviewed a guy who built a company in uh, Singapore to kind of actually own gold because he was so fed up with people buying gold for kind of some worst case scenario. And then he said that actually you don't have, they don't have gold. They don't have, a, they have like a paper gold. Mm. And that doesn't matter. 999 days it's only in the case that there is an actual black swan event that there is some problem with some government and the fiat actually collapses and there's like a mayhem in the traditional financial system which is exactly the situation that many of those gold investors wanted to protect themselves against and he says that that day they will discover they didn't have any gold uh, so the very thing they wanted to solve actually didn't work. And he built then this whole company with a huge vault and a very secure. I'll try to find the, the video because I almost have to see how it looks. It, it, it takes so much. 
and this is basically the only guy who has actually done it in the in the, in the world of course there's a few companies like that but he claimed they've done it the best so th that's what it takes he built like this special building and the special properties and this special legal setup where you actually have a piece of gold and then you can like have it there and because you obviously can't have it in your suitcase if you want to move around but you can have it there and so but so it is possible but it is so difficult it is so difficult to actually solve the problem where you can actually hold gold and also be able to move around and it's a very difficult problem to solve while with bitcoin it's uh, trivially easy to solve exactly that problem you actually have the bitcoin if you have the bitcoin so uh, it is uh, i think that when what happens now is that hard assets is going up in popularity more tra very traditional uh, entities like uh, even you know central banks and very traditional players they are buying more gold now and i think that many of those maybe not the central banks but many of the very traditional players will at least ask the question should we allocate at least you know one percent of this hard asset allocation we're doing to gold now should we allocate it to digital gold you know there's those crazy guys talking about digital gold you know perhaps it could be something in that should we allocate at least one percent and then someone says no and maybe they compromise on 0.5 percent but even that could be a huge uh, impact. And I think that this discussion wasn't up before for two reasons. One was that gold never seemed to break out. Now it has broken out. So gold is up on the agenda again. Second, it was difficult for those entities to get access to it in the first purchase. Like, okay, how, how should we purchase? They can at least start with ETF and then maybe move forward from there to more like uh, own asset allocation so i think that gold the gold breakout which is a historic breakout from the 2060 line i think it will help bitcoin i think so and in well, fact even though that bitcoin right now isn't trading like digital gold bitcoin is trading like a speculative asset so when when uh, risk goes up like world war three risk bitcoin dumps it doesn't pump uh, but i do think that this this uh, breakout from gold will help bitcoin because of that uh, sequence of events that i just described and also the the chinese central bank it's no secret they're the ones stacking the most gold and anybody who has done one hour of research will realize bitcoin is a better gold but the average person in the chinese market has to spend a 30 percent premium just to get their hands on gold. So that's a massive markup. That's like paying, what, nearly $100,000 for a Bitcoin <laughs> over the market, you know, 85 to 100, depending on the actual price of Bitcoin. But what was really interesting today is Willy Woo came out uh, with some new targets. And for the first time that I recall, he mentions ETFs bring price targets of 91K at the bear market bottom. He sets that as a new floor. Maybe you can pull up a chart later and what that actually looks like. And 650K at the bull market top, once ETF investors have fully deployed according to asset manager recommendations. That's like 3.5%, 5%, depending on the actual asset manager. And he says these are very conservative numbers and Bitcoin will beat gold market cap when ETFs have completed their role. Now we have a situation where uh, this is kind of interesting. So this is the math behind this as to how he approaches it. So asset managers manage $100 trillion, 2% allocation, that's 2 trillion. And we know I have this thing called the multiplier. Uh, the multiplier is somewhere between 40 and 56 right now. So for every dollar that goes into Bitcoin, you increase the market cap by 40 to 50 times that impact. And here he says Bitcoin is on chain investment of 561 million, projected to reach 2.56 trillion. And using the MVRV ratio to calculate market cap, 5x at bull market tops, 0.7x at bear market bottoms, you get this crazy price prediction of 650K. What, like since 2017, my thesis has always been scarcity. Supply and demand, you know, for more than I remember first economics class in school, 
I was a young teenager and it always seemed very logical to me. But what do you think of this type of mathematics behind these targets? I mean, the big, the, the fact is that if we get giant inflows, if we get trillions of dollars of inflows from asset managers, we don't need any TA, we don't need any formulas to, uh, or any people like us to figure out that the price will go up. It will go up massively, massively. Then how much it goes up is not easy to calculate. You cannot calculate that because it depends on how much pe people are willing to sell at that point. If no one is willing to sell, it only takes uh, $1 for price to go up, to shoot up, right? But if a lot of people are willing to sell, it takes much more money to pump price upwards. So it's not possible to calculate the price based on how much inflow it is. But the the factor will be somewhere between 50 and 100, I mean, typically something like that. It's not like a factor two, meaning that if you put $1 billion into Bitcoin, market cap doesn't go up with $1 billion. It will go up with $50 billion or $100 billion, something like that. And of course, if we are in this massive, crazy bull run, if these kind of inflows continue, and they've continued pretty consistently, like the ETF's inflow have been pretty consistent, who is selling there? Like, uh, who in their right minds wants to sell halfway through that? I think not so many. So I think the willingness to sell will be pretty low if these kind of inflows actually happen. So, uh, and I also wanted to say something else. Like, I, I don't think it's possible to calculate, okay, what will the Bitcoin target be? Will it be 650,000 or 91,000? I think it's, it's not possible to say, but I think... What is really helpful with these kind of exercises is that we need to open our mind to a wider range of possibilities. I think that's the biggest mistake that most people do. They think that price can only go up 10%. It can only go up 20% or 30%, or it can only go down 10% or 20%. No, price can go up 1,000%, 5,000%. Price can go down 90% and then 90% again. So opening our mind to a wider range of possibilities in technology assets specifically is maybe the single biggest best advice that you can ever ever take in to your really really absorb because perhaps this happens perhaps price goes to 600,000 in the end who knows is for and, me uh, it, you know it, it is possible i made these calculations based on just technical analysis calculation and you can, depending on how the parabolas repeat, it can come to 70,000 or it can come to 300,000. And I think hundreds of thousands of dollars per Bitcoin is absolutely, it's absolutely possible. It's not uh, some far out thinking. Uh, it's not. But then, of course, we cannot know exactly what will happen. No one can predict if Iran will send more missiles tomorrow, at least I cannot. We don't know those kind of things. So, I mean, we can also not say that we know that this will happen at this price at that date. No, we don't know that because we don't know um, when COVID can come or, you know, some war breaks out or something that really upsets the market. Yeah, well, we've seen what happens when war breaks out, markets dip, then they rebound immediately, and then they go to all-time highs because that means money printing, etc. But there is yeah. a little bit of nervous now with the Bitcoin price. We hit, I think, around 67,000 last night, which is a great recovery because on Friday we hit 65K. So I went up now, we're about 64.6. So we're still hovering around the 65K. I don't see us maybe, you know, once bitten, twice shy, the market won't be as panicked this time. A lot of the leverage has been flushed, but the Middle East is putting a bit of a lid on the markets. A lot of stuff is down right now. Uh, and Turkey just warned Israel against escalating tension with Iran. Erdogan has chosen the side of Iran, Yemen, Iraq, and Syria. And this puts NATO in a very difficult position right now as well. This thing is just a mess. And uh, I think... 
you know, as like what they call tit for tat aggression. You hit me, I hit you, you hit me, I hit you. And do you believe there'll be that boomerang attack where, okay, Iran fired missiles at Israel? Um, the president of Israel did threaten to hit the heart of Iran with a retaliation. Uh, I know the president of the U.S., at least I think, he's been very not present during this time of crisis. Uh, maybe there's something wrong with him. But uh, he did, I think, privately urge Israel not to hit back. Keep the lid on escalation. And I don't like talking about this stuff at all, but it does impact the market, so we kind of have to talk about it. What are your thoughts on what Israel will do next? Do you think they'll just say, okay, let bygones be bygones, or will they hit them back? And then what impact will that have on the market? I hope, because, of course, I it's very disturbing when these kind of things happen. What I hope to happen is that when... Iran launched those missiles, 300 missiles, whatever. They knew that they would probably get shot down on the way. They knew that, you know, 99% or something like that won't hit the target. So I think the positive, from a humanistic perspective, I think the positive take on this, which I hope is the case, is that they launched this well knowing that they're not going to hit much. And that then pacifies uh, in an internal uh, request to do something without causing so much damage that there is like a back and forth retaliation uh, going back and forth. And I hope that becomes the outcome that Israel can show that, you know, we've managed this, actually not much got damaged. And uh, we're going to, you know, send angry letters back or something like that. I, I hope that happens. And clearly that's what the market happens, because I don't know. I'm not a foreign policy expert. I just know that the, the, the conflict as such has been going on for over a thousand years. is not going to get resolved anytime soon. But I hope and I mean, if we stick to the fact, the markets clearly don't think that this is going to escalate. If we look at the charts for gold, stocks, indices, Bitcoin, you name it, the market is not trading like this is, uh, you know, the beginning of a escalating war. It's not. So the market participants in general think that that was it. Uh, you have to show some strong action without causing any real damage, and then let's move on with our lives. I hope so, and clearly the market in general thinks so. I, and I don't think you know Russia have made their intention clear to support Iran, but I don't think Russia wants to fight a battle on two fronts. Um, the U.S., I hope, will listen to the people of the U.S., but there's just so much anger and tension out there in the world. I just wish people will be logical and maybe go to ask AI, what is the solution for this? And maybe AI will have a smarter answer than some of the people in control here. All right, let's talk about one stunning chart. This is an all-time historic, scary, scary chart for anybody that knows. Now you got muted, James, I think. So this, this is probably the most stunning chart we will share today, unless you have one up your sleeve. I want to talk about ETH Bitcoin pair as well. But big, this is incredible. It's never happened in the history of the world where Bitcoin whales just over the last 155 days have snagged up 1.8 million Bitcoin. And that includes the spotty Jeffs. That includes Sailor. That includes Mr. 100, all these people. That's 9% of the circulating supply in less than 155 days. This has never happened. I know... Retail investors do own, you know, when you look at a whale bag, it might be owned by Grandma Jones, who has $100 in an ETF, two shares of something from BlackRock. Who knows? But the point is, this is staggering. Okay, I'll repeat. 1.8 million Bitcoin stacked in whale bags in 155 days. In four days, there will be 450 Bitcoin issued a day. The firm called BlackRock... On average, over 63, 64 trading days has bought 2,800 Bitcoin a day alone. Just one firm. What, what do you say to this? You've never seen on-chain data like this before. Um, what, what does this tell you about scarcity and what will happen next? 
And one other point too, a lot of the money that goes into these ETFs isn't coming out. A lot of traditional Bitcoiners think they're traders. Oh, they're just buying in now and they're going to sell at 60 bucks and get out again and get into 40. No, no. These are allocations that go into retirement funds that are not actively managed. It's set it and forget it. What are your thoughts? I would be very interesting to see more breakdown of this. I'm sure James, you're going to provide it and I will look at your channel when you do. Because of course, this is an astonishing uh, uh, chart. So I guess some of this is the ETFs, um, but you know, what is the rest? It's very, very interesting. It's very interesting to, to see the breakdown of this. Is it uh, exchange? What percentage of this is exchanges? Um, and uh, ETFs and so on. But it, it is, it's very interesting. It's very, very interesting. Clearly, big organizations, big companies, big players are, you know, adding to their wallets that we can say for sure. And um, now I think that I don't but, see... By, by the way, 500,000 of it is in the ETFs. So 1.3 yeah. million is other whales. 1.3 yeah. million. Mm. Uh, it's fantastic. It is fascinating. Do you know if it includes the exchanges? Uh, no, these are whale wallets, not exchange wallets. Other right. than ETF wallets, like you can see the Bitcoin wallet at Fidelity and Vanek yeah. and other players, but no. Anyway, there's another I thing think, that's kind yeah. of happening out there we have um bonds we have a serious issue with debt creation all over the world uh there was i think two or three weeks ago the us issued 1.2 trillion in debt in one day but now the the fiat governments are facing a real challenge it's become really really difficult to issue debt so they sell debt and they offer you you know 4.2 percent over the next 10 years but Anybody can look at the debt spiral. The gold chart sniffs out the debt spiral and the credit worthiness of these countries. If, if the US was a stock, its value would be zero because the debt spiral can never be turned back. Even if they taxed every American to death, took all their money, there's not enough money. It's done. There's, there's no way you can tax income anymore. And now it's just scary. So... Fiat is definitely a melting ice cube, and that also helps the Bitcoin story. Any thoughts on this one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's correct. If most, uh, or at least many Western countries, if they were a company, they would be bankrupt, actually, because, or at least the valuation would, uh, would be negative, <clears throat> because what's the net present value of ca future cash flow? As you say, you can't really turn it around and um, you would have to keep borrowing and uh, you wouldn't get the money. So it's, it's a, and this is so difficult to understand or even take in. I don't even, I don't know what it means. I actually don't know what it means in the long run, but it is concerning. It is definitely concerning. Like, <clears throat> It's like this, uh, I know a lot of people dislike this uh, author and the book, The Sapiens, but we, we have to understand that most of the things we take for granted, like the truths that feel like indisputable truths, they are just myths. They're just something we've made up and then we all believe in it and it seems like it's like a law of physics, but it's not. Can any of these countries actually kind of collapse? The can the co economy collapse and be replaced by something else? Yes, it can. It is definitely possible. Just because it hasn't happened doesn't mean it's not possible. So I, I think this is very concerning. And I don't see, from what I can understand, I don't see any real action to do anything about it. I think that most of these politicians, they just want to push the problem a little bit forward and let someone else take care of it and win the next election. I think that is the priority today. And I don't see this being sorted out. I think it needs much stronger action to actually turn this around and do something about it. And uh, 
if we keep having like more, what should I say, populism or short-term thinking, I don't know where it will end up. Where or where is this graph in 20 years, in 30 years, in 50 years, in 100 years? You know, what happens then? Yeah, it's, and it's... I think that the, the so the, the thinking that the US dollar is the most stable and secure thing that can ever exist. And if you have US dollar, you are safe. I don't think that's true on a long term horizon when we're looking at these trends. If these trends continue, that, that's not true and a statement anymore. Something else will have to be safe and secure. And maybe it's like physical gold, maybe it's digital gold, maybe it's something else we haven't invented yet. But this doesn't look so good from what I can understand. I'm not an I'm not a macroeconomist, but that's my understanding. Not. Uh, that's a couple quick topics to go through still. And maybe you can pull up that ETH BTC chart, which will come up in a minute. But yeah. Bitcoin market dominance is interesting. We hit a high since April 2021. Coincidentally, April 2021 was the time that Bitcoin hit the new all-time high of 67,000. November, six months later, it hit 69,000, but that was a manipulated cycle. So that's interesting that we are now at the DOM level. Do we go higher from here? Now, a lot of altcoins really got hit over the last couple of weeks. Um, we know that the meme coin stuff, which I do not participate in, has actually lifted a lot of liquidity away from other assets. And it's also made some chains very congested. We'll talk about that in a minute too. But what do you think of this dominance chart? And where do we go from here? Yeah. Is, is it like <clears throat> April 2021 high? If I can share my screen here, I do have some uh, input here. Hold on a second. Bo, I know I have it here. Yes, one chair. There you are. Did it. Yeah. So this is the general Bitcoin dominance. And the interesting thing is that it turned it has been an uptrend. It has been in solid uptrend all the way since late 2022, <clears throat> basically at the at the bottom. Then Bitcoin has trended up. I know it doesn't feel like that when you're looking at social media. It feels like everyone is making money right and left on altcoins, but most of the altcoin, I mean, the totality of the altcoin market has lagged versus Bitcoin during this period. And it has been selective altcoins that have been very successful, but not all of them, not the altcoin markets as a whole. We have not been in alt season here. This has trended up and now it trended up and it hit exactly this resistance level. This line here, it's not new. It comes all the way back here from 2020, 2019. I've had it in this chart for I don't know how many years. And we bounced up against that. So that's really the level to watch. It's about 57.2. If it breaks through that, okay, then we're up in this range. Then, you know, it could it could go to the range high there. Now it has gone to the range high of this range now. So if it turns here, perhaps we could get an old season if it starts falling, but it hasn't started falling yet. And if it breaks through this level, Oh, then Bitcoin dominance could go much higher. So we're at a critical point now. And what happens here with this level, first time it's rejected. You can see it very clearly here. I don't know if it's too small <coughs> or if it's visible on the screen, but it rejected there. First time it's rejected. Uh, so that's and really that, the that level. A, that rejection level is 57, correct? Yeah, exactly. It's 57. So what happens there now? That's to watch. That's what to watch if, if you know, we turn down. Perhaps altcoins will have a rally uh, versus BTC. But if it breaks through, Bitcoin go, could go much higher, much higher versus altcoins. And, uh, and, then... and for, the, for the last 90 days, it's been pretty clear that it is Bitcoin season because of yeah. the ETFs. We've seen unprecedented amount of money come into the space. And we're about to see more come in from China. So, um, But at the same time, you know, I, I'm still holding my, my Solana position. Uh, we'll see yeah. where that goes. And that has actually had some headaches as well. Uh, why don't you pull up the ETH BTC chart? Because I do have one here that, let me see. This is oh, the absolutely. ETH BTC yeah. chart. It's getting crushed. That means Ethereum is losing 
badly uh, to Bitcoin. What do you think of this? And what are you in an ETH position right now at all? I, I do have some little ETH, but very little now, because this looks absolutely garbage. The trend has been down. The trend is down on now on every single time frame. Yep. Daily candles, three day candles, you know, tw six hour candles, pick, pick any time frame and the trend is down. And more importantly, ETH BTC broke this very key level. So the price was in this rectangle and it didn't reverse. It tried twice, but failed. And now it broke on the downside instead. And for this to be remotely interesting, you need to reclaim this level and start turning the trend in the other direction on some time frames. And it hasn't happened yet. There was, I mean, the announcement, the Hong Kong included ETH ETF at, as well, but it hasn't moved. It has barely moved on that news. So it's really proof on the bulls here. It needs to reclaim these key levels and it hasn't yet. So this looks garbage at this point. And clearly like the momentum from base hasn't helped the Ethereum lay one price. Partly because maybe it, it doesn't cost that much. I mean, the, the layer two doesn't need to, you know, pay a lot of money or something to the layer one, or it's, it's very little fees to, to run the layer two. So it hasn't been reflected in the layer one price. And um, yeah, that's the situation from a tier perspective. This looks absolutely garbage. And this is the level here to reclaim at about uh, 0.051 ETH to BTC. That's the level to watch. Uh, an interesting question that always comes up, and that is, will, <coughs> for example, um, how strong, if an ETF does come for Ethereum, how much money will come into it? Or is it just too late? Do too many people recognize that ETH is no longer the hero of this market cycle? And it was last cycle. What do you believe in that regard? Do you think the ETH ETF could be anywhere near as popular as the Bitcoin ETF? Or is it just... I mean, there are arguments for right? one being that there is some yield or something like that. that you get some return because some asset managers, they don't like Bitcoin because there's no... Uh, yearly yield, there's no return, while Ethereum proof of stake would have that. Then. So that's the argument for. And but the problem here a little bit, as you as you mentioned, that I think some people will feel like, ah, Bitcoin is too late. I want uh, 100x, I want 1000x gains. Bitcoin is not going to give me that. I want some higher risk, higher reward opportunity. And Ethereum probably isn't that either at this point. It is a little bit late and there are like newer uh, projects with more upside probably. So Ethereum could be a little bit stuck in the middle. It's not this new exciting thing that has bigger upside but higher risk. And it's also not this very safe and secure, uh, like uh, lowest risk asset in the high risk crypto space because that is Bitcoin. So. It's neither of those. It's stuck in the middle a little bit. And being stuck in the middle with a value proposition is generally not good. It's not good to have like a balanced uh, position or something like that. No, it's better to have one, to fulfill one use case very well. Uh, and the use case to fulfill here is really the, the needs of that ETF investor. And I feel that Ethereum might struggle with this. I think the only case where it can win is if there only is the Ethereum ETF. Yep. So there is no BNB ETF or Sol ETF or something. It's Bitcoin and Ethereum, and that's the two you have to choose from. <coughs> and then I think some are going to put some money into Ethereum as well. Yep. Uh, or thinking that, you know, it might have higher upside or something like that. So let's talk about the so-called ETH killer, the consensus trade of this run. Uh, there's actually, I saw an interesting statistic. There's only six tokens that actually, if you exclude the meme coins and stuff, I think of the top 100, only six tokens beat Bitcoin this year. So Bitcoin has been very, very strong, but one of those is Solana. And there's been a lot of talk about the congestion. And there are two cures in place. This one has just released version 1.17. 
and we have version 1.18 that will fix it too. But of this list, you being a technologist as well, uh, can you explain to the audience how this can help? Because it reads like double Dutch to many, many people out there. Hello? You might be muted. Oop. I'm sorry. I wasn't sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, I know a lot of people have been very concerned that uh, Solana is broken, it can't be fixed. But no, it's not like that. These are, I mean, when building out a high capacity network in live production, and you have no idea how it's going to be used, stuff mm -hmm. will happen that you didn't fully anticipate. And then you have to modify the protocol, you have to change some parts of the execution engine, your execution environment to cater for those things that you kind of didn't really expect would happen. And uh, I think that the growth of the Solana ecosystem and the kind of opportunity to bring in, uh, you know, spammy type of transactions has surprised many and it can maybe happen faster than, than thoughts. But these problems, those kinds of problems are solvable. In every single time, we will never end up in a situation where, oh, no, this can't be fixed. It's over, guys. That's not going to happen. Those kinds of problems can be solved in software engineering and high, high capacity systems. So I have never doubted that this is going to solve it. And now they're rolling out some patch and then there will be more fix uh, like uh, in the next major version, but I think that it, it, yeah, it, it's going to solve it guys. This is going to, it's going to be like this. When something grows that much, there will be problems that's expected and you deal with it to roll out fixes and uh, then will be the next problem after that. But um, that's just how it works. And I think that this is potentially an opportunity. If I can share the screen again, um, Now I think yeah. you are muted. Yeah. yeah. Just to sh just to show how radical because we talked we transitioned from the Ethereum um, chart and I think a reason one of the reason Ethereum looks like this is is the success of Solana. <clears throat> so if you just remember this is how the Ethereum chart looks Ethereum versus BTC. Here is the BNB chart. You know the th the project that we forgot. It looks radically better. And that's the kind of neutral horse then. And then here is the Solana to BTC chart. They are like night and day. If we zoom out and look at the past, um, um, yeah, it's not, it's almost a year. So <clears throat> the past six to nine months. But if we zoom in a little bit on the, on the price, these technical issues, I think has hurt the price. I think this drop, this looked great. This chart looks looked great all the way until about 5th of April, because this is a flag. Price moves up, then it consolidates in a flag pattern. But then instead of confirming this flag with an upside breakout, this broke down. And here it actually looked pretty ugly. And then I think on the USD chart, this was a 30% drop. <clears throat> and I think that the reason here was that people actually started getting worried. Will Solana work? What will happen with all these issues? You go to Jupiter or something and the swap doesn't work. It fails and people started getting, getting uh, worried. So I think that the technical issues have been reflected in the chart. Then I think also that the solution to those technical issues can move the price back in the other direction. So you kind of undo the the event and i think that can happen here so <clears throat> that's my take on this i think the problem will get solved and i do think that there will be a relief in the market seeing that oh actually jupiter works again or whatever problem you had before with your app so that's my take on this and i mean the trend hasn't turned down obviously on neither <clears throat> sold to BTC or sold to USD. Yeah. So um, that's the situation. I think that um, I hope that this uh, this migration goes well and uh, that they fix the issue. And then I think there's good chances that the price recovers.
Good. And also the fire, they had a new fire dancer release went into beta yesterday too, which could solve all problems, hopefully as well. Uh, one final thing before we open up to some questions, uh, a little bit of British news. There's a lot of, a lot of rumblings coming out of. I think you got muted, James. A lot of rumblings coming out of Europe right now. Norway want to ban Bitcoin mining, despite them having a lot of excess stranded energy. Super interesting. But now the U.S. stablecoin regulation is coming in July 2024, which is good news. And they want to be ahead of the U.S. stablecoin regulation. So I think this is good, but there's so much mixed signals coming from Europe. It's all very confusing. And I know the UK is on their own after Brexit. Uh, any thoughts on stablecoin regulation across Europe? I think the regulation that's coming in Europe with the Mika regulation, this one in the UK, I think it's good. I think it's great. I think it's fantastic because what happens without this kind of regulation is that because Europe is very traditional, there's a lot of very traditional people in power and they don't know what to do. They don't understand this whole sector. It seems dangerous. It seems like there's something criminal are doing and they don't know what to do. So the default response becomes then that ah, we should uh, stop it in some way. They don't know what to do. They, it's a complex field to understand what to do with it. And if there is no clear rules from someone who understands the sector, the outcome becomes that we don't allow it at all in our organization, or, you know, our bank or our um, financial institutions. While if there are clear regulation, which seem like it's sorted out, they will follow those regulations. So it will be like these things you can do, these things you cannot do. And then the things that you can do will actually be permitted. I think that will be the outcome. And I think that is much, much better than what we have today, where there's like a knee jerk reaction that, uh, you know, watch out for the dangerous crypto, whatever it is. We don't know what it is, but we think it's something dangerous and you better watch out. That's, that's where we are today. And Mika and all other regulation will, I think, sort that out and divide it very clearly. Here are the legal things, here are the permitted things, and these things you can do. And uh, then people will follow that. And it will be, you know, more day-to-day, -day, everyday, uh, everyday thing. So I think it's great. Awesome. All right, let's go to Q&A time. Uh, the market, by the way, it looks still a little bit weak, but Bitcoin's still ha hanging around that 65K mark. So. Lots of concern about what's happening, you know where, but uh, we'll see. Let's talk about the questions, the issues that are on the people's minds right now in our little Q&A live session. And a big thank you to the moderators out there that are bringing in all the questions. So first question is from Daniel. What does runes do for Bitcoin miners and Bitcoin? Have you been tracking the new runes? I think it's a new version of ordinals. I have a little bit, but I I want to study it more. I'm not sure I completely understand it actually. So um, yeah. yeah, I think I want to come back to it rather than share my half understanding because I didn't really get it. It's it's actually. a new it's a new version of Ordinals NFT creation on Bitcoin, and uh, a lot of people think it's bad because it can again make congestion happen on the Bitcoin network and Bitcoin should just be a purely store of value. But at the same yeah. time, a lot, a lot of people believe the ruins can be good because it generates a lot of fees for Bitcoin miners, which keeps the network very secure. So it's kind of like, exactly. a, I didn't fully understand. Can it cause real issues in the, in types of congestion? Because yeah. in a way, Bitcoin is still vulnerable. You know, there can be so many transactions that you can't really use it effectively. That, and I couldn't really understand if runes are a threat to that or if it will work fine also with runes. And because it's good if we bring more business to the miners. I always felt that we should do more things that are beneficial to the miners. So let's, um, I mean, I actually was in the camp that I think is fine 
to bring in a little bit more transactions in each block to kind of support the miners, lower the fees for the users and so on. And I feel that uh, computers have gotten more powerful from 15 years ago. You know, maybe we could at least keep up with more slow or something like that to enable more of these things, uh, lower fees, more transactions and more business to the miners. But um, I do also appreciate the argument that we should never change Bitcoin. Bitcoin should just be like gold. It can never change. Gold is the same 2000 years ago as it is today. But now I feel we're kind of somewhere a little bit in between. We want to do a little bit of this fun um, uh, NFTs, but we also don't want to change the network because it should always be the same. And then we're introducing these things, which we actually can't really overlook what it's going to do to the network because it's kind of complex. And um, yeah, I, I, uh, it's, it's a big, um, at the same time as the Lightning Network isn't really taking off. So I, I uh, yeah, it's a complex area. We, we need to study it more, I think. It's, uh, it's funny, I was in touch with um, Fred Krueger and he, he's like a Bitcoin maxi but he loves the originals and ruin stuff as well. So it's interesting that uh, people appreciate, you know, the freedom and decentralization of the platform. So you should be able to build and do what you want on it. And it helps the miners. It makes the network more secure and it makes more money for the miners too, which is important after the halving. And we've seen what happens. These things come in fits and starts like ordinals, spikes dumps spikes dumps it's just whatever is the flavor of the day next question is from ashley i'm confused it's a hong kong etf not a chinese etf or are china and hong kong the same china banned crypto no well i'll take a little bit of this and you can chime in after so first of all um as i always describe hong kong is like the financial district of china those they're basically one country despite hong kong have separate laws but though it's the number one trading partner and those that want financial transactions done in mainland China can do them through Hong Kong. Now, that doesn't, so a lot of people think, oh, Hong Kong's small. Well, it's not. Hong Kong's very big and has a lot of billionaires per capita, one of the highest places on earth. And China has a lot of billionaires too. So anybody in mainland China that has money will find a way to get a rail to get access to Bitcoin in Hong Kong. That's not, not going to be a problem. And I think it was Bloomberg as well said this is going to unlock $25 billion over the next year into Bitcoin from China and Hong Kong alone. Remember, my target for the Bitcoin ETFs in the US was $50 billion for the year. This is half the size. So it is substantial. And we'll see. And we're going into that tremendous scarcity. I can't remember. I did a calculation of the amount. Like if every millionaire on earth, 68,000 millionaires, if they decided to buy one Bitcoin, they couldn't. There's about 0. 0.0000662 whatever Bitcoin per millionaire. It's just so scarce. But what do you think, again, uh, regarding this concern? Um, oh, one final point as well. China is now, they've discovered closing the doors to capital markets and clamping down on the capital market system was bad for the economy. And now they're much more open to attracting more capital, more free capital markets to China as well. Over to you. Yeah, so Hong Kong is a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China. I had to check so I'm saying it exactly correct. But in practice, it means that if you're living in mainland China and you're an investor, it could be pretty difficult for you to go and buy a BlackRock uh, ETF but you can probably get access to invest on the Hong Kong exchange. So there is a difference. And then this is not as clear cut as it is like the rules sometimes in, in uh, the US or something, but it is definitely more accessible in Hong Kong for mainland China investors. Absolutely. So it is important. Next question is from Rubbo. Uh, I wonder if another big benefit of ETFs is that in the future we will be it'll be easier for us to collateralize it for fiat loans, like borrow fiat against your Bitcoin to buy real estate or something else. Um, and the answer is yes. Thoughts on that, CTO? Oh yeah, absolutely. 
I mean, sadly, the companies that were doing it turned out to have also doing some fraudulent stuff in the back room, which was very unfortunate because really that use case is huge. And um, I do hope that new companies come along and do exactly that and do it kind of in the same way. Just don't do any uh, illegal stuff in the or alleged illegal stuff in the back room. That's what we really need, and uh, because the the use case is enormous, there is people who want to uh, borrow uh, crypto to to trade with it, rather than selling other office, uh, uh, selling other assets and realize capital gains. It's better for many large investors to borrow um, Bitcoin assets, trade with them, and uh, not have to. Uh, realize that capital gains at the same time as there is a market for people who have crypto assets they don't want to sell them and move them out into fiat but they want to i don't know buy a boat or something you know they want to take a loan against it and um, then uh, you know want to do that so so um I do hope this becomes a much bigger thing than it is today I mean there are already loan platforms but the collateralization ratio is so bad right you have to put in a lot you have to lock up a lot of crypto there to borrow little money because the asset platform want to protect themselves if there's movements in the price so uh, it's not there isn't really a good solution but i do think it will come eventually on much larger basis hundred times thousand times the volume that we have today absolutely and a little a little life hack as well for people to understand Rich people don't sell assets. They leverage them, borrow against them, and write off the interest on borrowing against them, against their taxes, and they use the money they get from leveraging the assets to buy more assets. It's the infinite money glitch, not dissimilar to what MicroStrategy and others are doing. So I think the rails and the infrastructure will be far more secure with very reliable players in the very near future, like the Fidelities of the world, maybe the Black Rocks, where it'll be very easy to do that. They're already doing it, by the way, for special players, if you are a credit investor. But for the average person, it'll be coming and it'll be mature and it'll be safe and it'll be an interesting time. Um, so the, the net message there is, Try not to get too cute selling your Bitcoin, paying a ton of capital gains to enter back in when you can borrow against it, when the time comes. Um, now, Mike Lind said, Ethereum ETF approval in Hong Kong is bullish for ETH spot ETF in the USA. Thoughts? My thoughts on that are simple. The US SEC, it's clear that they do not have the best interests of people at heart. That's all I'll say on the subject, and they're definitely not going to follow what China do. But I think it's an okay thing for the ETF, for the ETH as a product, but the U.S. will not follow China. CTO? I don't know. I think that the whole thing here with uh, whether crypto is something that should be cr crushed or a great innovation that should be supported, it is largely a political decision at this point. And there's so many parties here, if we're talking about the US specifically, from what I can observe from the outside, that there are politicians that are in one camp, that we should support this innovation, we should be pro-innovation. Then there's a lot, a lot of other politicians who are that we should try to stop change, we should preserve the legacy for some reason i can't really understand how they can end up in that camp but clearly there's a lot of people in that camp and then that becomes like a political decision and then these different agencies sit there and um, uh, some different random judges might have different opinions trying to read uh read things that were written 50 or 100 years ago and try to apply it on today's digital assets, which becomes a little bit arbitrary because obviously the very smart and intelligent people who wrote those things 50 or 100 years ago, they couldn't imagine that where we would sit now. Maybe if they knew how this would be used, maybe they would have clarified it. But now it's kind of unclear. So after 10, 15 years, we still can't get a straight answer from the Securities and Exchange Commission about which of the, say, top 10 coins are securities. 
it's uh, clearly not clear. So uh, it's I think it comes down to political decision. And uh, it seems like the two main parties in the US perhaps have different uh, takes on this. So perhaps it will depend on the election outcome. But I do disagree on one thing. I think that the fact that if you can go to Hong Kong and trade Ethereum ETF and you can't do it in uh, the US, I do think that some politicians won't feel good about that. They will feel like, oh, wow, is China taking our investor money here? We should maybe look at this again. Exactly. A uh, very good point. Uh, there's also um, another question from Charles uh, Benitez. Should we long ETH BTC at the low of the macro range? But I think ETH is poop. Cannot even buy it if it is cheap. Uh, what would what would your advice be here? Although you don't give advice on ETH BTC long in the range, do you think it'll rebound from here or continue to be destroyed by Bitcoin? I, if, 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 I put it another way: if you had a choice, what to buy? Would you buy Bitcoin or ETH? Yeah, I can. I cannot uh, tell what other people will do, but I can say what I will do uh, because, um, and I can share the chart here if you don't mind. So. so I have a very clear strategy. Wrong one. I personally, I mean, it could be that this is the bottom. Who knows? Maybe, you know, ETH, uh, ETF rumors start coming and it starts shooting up. Perhaps it's the bottom. But for me personally, I much rather buy at higher prices with lower risk than take a gamble here because now we're below we're below the support. We broke through the support. So now we're sitting below the support. And I'd much rather buy here at 0 0.52 than here at 0 0.48. It's not that much difference. I'd rather buy at higher prices with higher confidence and lower risk than to buy a gamble at uh, lower prices and hope that it turns around. It might, but it might not. I'm not interested in gambling on those kind of things. I want to see confirmations in price action that price is being reclaimed, trend is turning up, then I'm interested to buy. And just because you buy with at higher price, it doesn't mean that you will make less money because you can buy with more money if you take lower risk. And that's maybe too big subject to take at the last minute of the show. but. That's something to really wrap your, ha your head around. You don't need to buy at the lowest prices. You just need to buy with low risk. And then you can uh, buy with a bigger position instead. And if you don't have more money, okay, then you buy with, you know, zero po with 1.2 uh, times leverage or something like that. It's better to buy with uh, at lower risk. That's the summary. So that's what yeah. I will do. I will sit and wait. I will not do anything with this. Good advice. The wait for the trend. The wait for the trend to turn. Very good advice yeah. there. Um, there is another question from Matthew Smead. What about BlackRock tokenizing on ETH? A lot of ETH questions today. Um, my take on it, BlackRock is, of course, a powerhouse. Larry Fink understands everything is going towards the blockchain. The tokenization of everything we've been talking about for years is coming fast. And BlackRock have launched a thing called BUIDL. They're USD Institutional Digital Liquid Fund. They only put $100 million in, and to BlackRock, $100 million is like nothing. Uh, but they do want to tokenize a lot of stuff and have a transparent instant settlement layer out there. It's kind of like the way Coinbase is moving to base. They want to leverage blockchain to become more effective and efficient in what they do. Um, now, what I think will happen, and I'm interested in what you think on this. First of all, when you have a big institution like BlackRock, they want to go to the safe place. They don't care about hundreds of dollars in fees. They can deal with that. What is interesting is um, what they'll do afterwards. Like we saw Circle go to ETH first. Now they do all their activity on Solana. So they put their toe in the water, test on a platform, see if it works, get their scars and learn, and then they can always pivot to another platform. But I don't think this will be the savior. It, it, it'll help Ethereum, but it doesn't mean it'll be tokenization, real world assets on Ethereum forever. The market's fickle and they'll move to the best, most secure, most scalable platform. Plus, by the way, if BlackRock chooses, final, sorry about this, I think a lot about this. 
because the the ETH maxis are so excited that oh, BlackRock is tokenizing on on Ethereum and nothing else. If BlackRock really tests this at scale to tokenize real estate and stocks and all that type of stuff, there's no way ETH can scale, period. Even base only runs at like 16 transactions per second or 30 maximum. So it's it's not it's not gonna cut it unless ETH radically changes. What do you think? Yes, I agree uh, with what you said that the Bitcoin has a unique position. There is only Bitcoin that is kind of the digital gold today. There were challengers to that, though. If we look back on the history, it could have turned out differently because Ethereum almost took the position and it took it uh, like twice, almost. Like the first time was in the ICO boom. No one stopped caring about how much something cost in Bitcoin terms. Everything was priced in ETH. ETH became the money. Then that uh, crashed on itself. It like uh, overblew and it was ended up a lot of scams and it, the whole thing crashed. So for good reason, that went away. This was in 2017, uh, 2018. And then Bitcoin became money again. But and then came the NFTs, the NFT boom. Suddenly, even in the crypto community, Bitcoin couldn't hold the position of being money. It was Ethereum that became money. Everything was priced in how many ETH does this uh, funny JPEG cost? The, yeah. the money was ETH. But then that kind of fizzled out also. And Ethereum never really managed to take the position. I'm just saying that it could have happened. It, it, now it seems impossible, but it wasn't that far away. And there was also challengers for the actual Bitcoin position. People have forgotten about that, but it wasn't that far away that the uh, BCH one actually flipped Bitcoin. Uh, it was like uh, it was one uh, Korean exchange pulling the plug at midnight away, I think, from that to actually happen. So it could have happened. But now, in present time, there is no doubt. There is only one contender for digital gold and for money and stability in crypto, and that is Bitcoin, full stop. There's nothing else. Not mm -hmm. Ethereum, not an, uh, any of the other ones. Good. While as a utility platform, Ethereum, uh, you know, Binance Smart Chain, AVAX, uh, Sol, and so on, there's a lot of contenders that do kind of a little bit the same use case that you can run smart contracts, and those smart contracts can do different things. You can swap assets, you can run a DEX, you can trade NFTs, and you can do a lot of different things. And there, there's a hard competition. Now there's a hard competition and there is no monopoly for anyone. Users are fickle. They happily take their money and move to another chain if there's more opportunity there. And right now, Ethereum Lay One is not the best of the bunch. It's expensive, it's congested, and yeah, it's not it's not really there yet today. So the the Hope for Ethereum has been that one of the layer twos will take that role. Um, and uh, I think the best hope right now is the base. But it is really a difficult situation for Ethereum at this point. I think that they got stuck in the middle. <clears throat> they want it to be, it should be easy to run a node. It should be very decentralized. But at the same time, we should have a little bit lower fees. So you ended up with kind of not really solving any of the problems particularly well and that's that's the situation and i think just like you said james if you start using a utility platform a public <coughs> blockchain to run your smart contract why limit yourself to one why not have uh, five uh, options ten options or at least like uh, three options to run your smart contract on i think that's a natural progression and that will today probably be ethereum perhaps an Ethereum layer 2 and Solana. I think uh, uh, Binance Smart Chain has uh, had a lot of like bad publicity uh, lately. So I don't think that most US entities want to be associated with that perhaps. But uh, Solana is like, uh, seems legit and uh, is cheaper. So will it happen? I think so too. 
Yes, interesting. And one final question and a big thank you as well to the mods in the chat, Daniel Moore and Simon. Loads of money. Final question. What can, what can, or how can AI, this is from Anishap. Looks like it's a Russian name. Uh, how can AI solve the issue of silly, greedy, greedy dictators? So uh, this is kind of digital era type conversation. I see the convergence of two big things happening. Decentralization in the form of crypto and AI. Now, AI gives the people the power to analyze a lot of data. Uh, you know, you could analyze 5,000 years of history saying, what should I do in this situation? AI, what do you think? Do I go left or do I go right or do I stay in the middle? It's that simple. So AI has the power to make dictators smarter but the problem is dictators are irrational and they're power hungry. Um, but what, what do you think? Is there, can AI make greedy dictators better in the future or will they remain greedy dictators? <laughs> it's a hard question. I don't think people will change. <clears throat> and um, that's a reason you can, you, I, I rephrase. You can see some evidence that people don't change. The price charts today in uh, Bitcoin or any of your random altcoins in year 2024, when we have ChatGPT and everything, they look exactly the same as any stock chart in the 1930s. That's why the technical analysis works, because it's like 100 years old. So how can that still work? Well, it works because there's people behind it taking uh, usually rational decisions or at least behaving in certain ways, we, we work faster now. So things are compressed in time, but you can take any chart, overlay it, and you couldn't tell if you didn't see the, the scale. You couldn't tell if it's an altcoin, an NFT, or a stock from 1936. You couldn't tell the difference. They look exactly the same. So I don't think that AI is going to do anything with uh, politicians. Uh, greedy dictators, great politicians, or anything like that. I don't think we will change as people, but as you mentioned, James, I call this the era digitalis. Crypto isn't happening in isolation. AI isn't happening in isolation. It's seven different things that work together. That's happening at the same time, and they synergize each other. And I think that the world and the society will change much more than we can, than even we can imagine. We, we we think it will change a lot. We are one of the people who think that this will really change. You know, the hard assets, Bitcoin, AI, Tesla, all that stuff. It will have radical change on society. While most people didn't think so if we rewind a few years back. And so far, it has had big impact. We work digitally now. AI is becoming part of many jobs. People are getting replaced by AI. And uh, crypto is uh, has not gone away. It seems like it's a bigger thing than ever. And so, but I don't think the people will change, but society will change. And I think it will. I don't know if it will change how we govern uh, countries and so on. I don't think so. But I think it will reduce the impact and the power of any single country leader, because suddenly there sits a parallel structure. Someone running a tech company, a global tech company, suddenly has a lot of power. And in many cases, perhaps more power than that elected country president. And I think you saw it one time in the US, right? I can say it. I know this is a very sensitive subject, but I'm not from the US, so I can I can uh, you know talk about it. But w there were like four um, CEOs of tech companies that went and uh, dethroned the sitting US president, and they you know removed him from all social media. And then then basically, you lose a lot of your power as a politician. And that was uh, for um, for uh, leaders of tech companies. And I think I don't know. I can't say if it was good or or bad that that uh, uh, people can debate in the comments. But I think we will see more of that kind of thing that we saw a small taste of. And I I don't think perhaps that was a good thing. But 
I think there can be good things coming out of it also, that there is another structure building. For example, we have uh, a set of open source uh, Bitcoin developers that building something on this direction when all the central banks are built in this direction. And I think a lot of those things will happen. We have Elon Musk building tech companies in this direction, while all the other organizations are built in this direction. And I think that those kind of things can balance up, coming back to the question, I think that those tech companies can balance up a greedy dictator. And if I can take just one more minute, because I have a personal story to share. It didn't end well, but it was a step in that direction. I lived in Myanmar among all the countries. It was the last telecom frontier. So we built a mobile network there in a country that hadn't had it before. Most people had never made a phone call. You could walk on the street and in in the lawn in front of the house, it sat like a a sign in the grass saying we have a telephone so you could go in there and make like a fixed line telephone call that was like a, a way to some people made extra money because most people didn't have a telephone so that some people had a telephone and then uh, two years later we had built one of the world's most efficient 4g networks there and uh, people then quickly went from uh, never ha never having made a phone call in their life never sent a letter to having iphones in like overnight and then they actually held elections and the sitting party lost. The, the, the ruling party lost to Aung San Suu Kyi's party. And they had a change of power. And Aung San Suu Kyi said that we could never have done it without you guys who built the telecom network. Because suddenly it wasn't possible to cheat anymore. It's because people stood there and, you know, live streaming on Facebook outside the election booth. It wasn't possible to cheat anymore like it was in the old area and she said that we could never have done this without the telecom network and that was one example of those where a global telecom network actually did something uh, that impacted the dictator then this didn't go all the way because a couple of years later those generals thought that oh but it was better before when we had all the power so let's dust off the tanks and drive them out on the motorway and take it all back and then they took it all back so it didn't go. That was after I had left, uh, uh, though. So, but um, uh, we, so we, it didn't we had go the same. The way, we had the I same story. That... We had the same story last week with Elon Musk in Brazil, the head uh, senior judge of the government who works for the president Lula. If I got that right, tried to silence their critics on Twitter. Two hundred names to shut them down in Brazil so they couldn't speak, and we've seen a lot of that silencing happen during twenty twenty with the C-19 situation. And it just shows you the most important thing in the world is freedom of speech. And the other thing we're seeing right now as well, this digital era is enabling people to embrace decentralization, which means freedom of speech and open communications and honesty and truth. And also the cryptocurrency is giving people the life raft so they can actually change their lives and get out of one of these regimes if they need to. And I think what's going to happen in the very near future, the combination of AI and crypto and decentralization, a lot of people will vote with their feet. They've already started doing it, but but the, those that can will do it at scale and they'll get out of these regimes. And then when I talk about regimes, I'm also not talking about dictatorships. I'm talking about some of the Western countries too, where we see people flee like crazy. They see the problems, they see the deficits, they see the taxes, they see the authoritarian control of governments, and they are voting with their feet. I know that's a, a dark note to end on everybody, but CTO, any quick response to that? Because uh, oh, Absolutely. It, I mean, yeah. uh, the world has gotten more, much more mobile. Previously, everything was physically tied to physical location, the country and everything you can never move. Now, most people are working digitally anyway. Work, the work is like in the laptop. <clears throat> and I think that countries will find themselves competing for talent and competing for investment in a way that the world has never seen before. <clears throat> more and more people are getting much more mobile and the people who move first are the innovators, the um, you know digital uh, pioneers. And uh, I think that this will come as a shock 
to many, how should I say, legacy countries that people are actually checking out from, I don't know, Germany and moving to uh, El Salvador to set up their new tech company there or something like that, that they thought would never happen, but suddenly it's actually happening. <clears throat> and um, um, I, will, I think we will see new type of company, new, com new countries uh, being more successful than the legacy countries. It's the countries that try actively to attract innovation, try to attract capital, positive to change, that will be the winners. And the losers will be the legacy countries that try to stop change and protect what we had before. I don't think that will work so well in era digitalis when the whole world is going digital. Six out of the six biggest companies in the US are all tech companies and we're all working remote. That's a lousy strategy, it's not gonna work. And the winners will be uh, these hungry countries, uh, hungry for innovation, hungry for uh, the digital era. That too as well, we're seeing that with crypto technologists. They're not building in the US, they go. <laughs> they're in Dubai, they're in El Salvador. And that's just the beginning of what's actually coming. So anyway, scary times, everybody. We've gone over an hour. In fact, it's 80 minutes. I'm very grateful, CTO. Unfortunately, Ivan was stuck in a family event, so he couldn't join us today. But uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you to the mods in the chat. Thank you for all the great questions. Uh, Bitcoin's rebounding, 64.5, back up, 64.750. You know, uh, I think there will probably will be some type of retaliation. I pray smarter minds will prevail and we get peace in the Middle East again. There is no winner in war, but I wish the leaders would figure this out. Thank you so much, CTO, for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, here. everyone. We'll catch Thank each you. other next week, I think, on your channel, CTO, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah. we'll figure it out. Okay. Yeah. Good. Have a great week, everybody. And remember, four days to the having. That's a bonkers thing to consider. Wow. I, I am excited. Are you? Four days? Can you believe it? <laughs> oh, it's amazing, actually. It's a big event. In big event. Space. And a lot of people, by the way, say, oh, it's a sell the news event. No, 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 no. <laughs> what we've seen over the last 64 trading days, all of a sudden, half the supply is available. It's a guaranteed thing. The price will go up. There might be fluctuations short term, but medium term, we are going higher, a lot higher. So thank you, everybody. If we should end on a positive note, uh, yes. on touching on that, in every previous halving, the pump after the halving has been bigger than the pump before the halving. Yes. That's a fact. And, and in the last cycle, once the halving happened, the price at the halving, Bitcoin only fell once by 0.4%. So if history repeats, there is no dip after the halving. So... That's just history. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. Have a great week and we'll see you all soon. Bye. Don't forget to subscribe to CTO link below. Bye.